Hi. Good evening. Good night. <laughs> First of all, I wanted to say how very excited I am to be here this evening. Um, and thanks for coming. I'd like to talk about biomimicry. Biomimicry is taking inspiration from nature to improve design. It's really practical biology. Now, most of us work inside offices, or at least inside buildings. And although the term biomimicry may be a relatively new one, I believe the subject is not. I believe that biomimicry used to be more intuitive. And although we've perhaps become a little bit detached from our environment, I think that we can reconnect. I think it can become something that we use again. In this talk, I'd like to give some examples of biomimicry in the past, more recently in construction, and how in the future we can use modern technology to take this subject to a new level, to what I'd like to refer to as biomimicry 2.0. Perhaps the most diversely talented person to have ever lived, and possibly one of the first biomimetic engineers, was Leonardo da Vinci. He was an artist, a musician, a writer, a geologist, a mathematician, and amongst other things, he was a biologist and an engineer. You can clearly see, if you study his work, that he took inspiration from nature and used them in his designs. Nowadays, we major in single subjects through school, and we get trained in work to carry out very specialized functions. And in doing so, we lose our other skills in the process, and we lose that cross-pollination of ideas from one field to another. Now, Leonardo da Vinci studied birds, and this led to an interest in flight, and he went on to design flying machines. Less well known is that Leonardo da Vinci recorded marine mammals underwater, making noises, using what we now call as echolocation, to communicate and navigate underwater. We still study whales and dolphins to this day to further our understanding and to improve our equipment. So it's still just as relevant as it is today as it was back then. I'd li like to give another example um, more recently, which is from this uh, kingfisher. Now, this guy dives off trees into water to catch his fish. So he goes from one medium, air, into another medium, water, in an almost seamless fashion. He does it without making a splash. And this is relevant because the first bullet trains um, had problems when they went into tunnels because of noise. So they had to slow down, and this cost them time. So they went to the biologists, and they said, OK, you know, we've got this problem with noise. How can you help us? And the situation was very similar. Um, air, water, train, tunnel, which is now why the trains look like this. So this is a less well-known example, but it's still very classic biomimicry. Um, my final example, just generally speaking, is, is that of Velcro, something that everybody knows. Um, and it was inspired by those um, seed pods, those annoying things that get stuck in your socks when you go walking, burrs. So I hope you get an understanding of what this subject is. Um, because I could ca carry on giving examples all night. Evolution is like the world's longest, greatest brainstorming session ever. Nature is constantly coming up with new ideas, practicing them, testing them in real-world scenarios and discarding failures. And it's been doing this without a rest for, for almost four billion years. So business yearns innovation, and business yearns in invention. Well, nature is the epitome of invention and innovation. Businesses increasingly realize the importance of being more sustainable. Well, nature's more than sustainable. Nature creates conditions conducive for new life, for new growth. And I wonder if we could use this as a business model. So this is a huge subject, and I work in construction. So I now want to relate biomimicry to buildings and to the built environment, because I feel there's a huge potential in this field. Buildings consume a large amount of resources, and they produce a lot of waste, and thereby contribute to climate change. So I went on the internet, and I found the oldest example of biomimicry in construction that I could. And it came from the Amazonian uh, giant water lily. 
which was the inspiration for parts of the Crystal Palace back in 1847. The architect Joseph Paxton used the same structural layout of the leaf to design the large circular glass windows that you can see behind me. So an old palace in London may not seem that relevant these days, so I'd now like to draw your attention to the Eastgate Center in Harare. This is the largest shopping mall in Zimbabwe, and it covers over 30,000 square meters of land. Zimbabwe, as you know, is a hot African country, and the temperature often exceeds 30 degrees. But this building has no air conditioning system, or at least no conventional system. Instead, it has taken an idea from one of nature's most industrious engineers, the termite. These guys are like senior project engineers. What they do is in order to enable them to have a low domestic temperature in their mounds, they build an elaborate system of tunnels um, throughout their mounds to, to do this. Now, here in Dubai, you'll probably be familiar with wind towers. Now, these work by channeling wind into them and down to ventilate the rooms below. Well, termite mounds use the wind traveling over the surface of the mound to pull hot air out at the top, create a vacuum, and thereby pull cooler air in the base. The Eastgate Center uses exactly the same principle. And in doing so, it saves the developers huge upfront costs, and it uses less power, so it's cheaper and it's greener as a result. Now, it may not be the most attractive structure. It uses a lot of concrete, but I'm sure that architects and engineers can take this inspiration and take it further, make these types of buildings even better. The reason I mention concrete, this is a seamless segue you can see coming on here, is because cement, um, the largest constituent of concrete, produces, uh, is, sorry, is a building material used across the world. In case you didn't realize, cement production is massive. Um, and in fact, cement production produces a lot of carbon dioxide, which if you've seen the film An Inconvenient Truth, you'll know is a pretty serious matter. Cement production is the third largest contributor of carbon dioxide in all of industry. Oh, actually, some scientists in America are taking inspiration from cement production, um, or rather from the seashells, and they are making cement, or they've started, the tests have, have come out, and if, if their factory is successful, they'll be able to make cement just like the seashells do. The way in which we make cement and the way in which seashells make their, their skeletons and their shells, sea animals, is very similar to the way in which we make our own bones. And I'd now like to draw your attention to some work done by a scientist called Klaus Mathek, who has been studying how bones achieve strength by overlapping fibers with composite materials, and how, like trees, they distribute the stress across the, the structures in such an um, efficient way. Now, He's, he's been working on the subject for a long time. He's created a lot of data. He's collected the data. People have turned it into software, and they've now got software that mimics the overlapping structure of the fibers with composite materials. And this software has already been used in cars. Some well-known brands have, have come up with new cars that are as crash safe as conventional cars, but up to 30% lighter. Obviously, this is, this is great. It uses much less material, but it also uses much less fuel now, I'm not just going off on some bizarre tangent here on interesting cars. I want you to imagine if we can use that type of software in buildings. Imagine how efficient we could make their structures. OK, so buildings aren't just structures. There's a lot going on inside them. And I mentioned before that they consume a lot of resources. Water is one of the most precious of these. And although it's not an exclusively local problem, we should find local solutions, like nature does. The camel. This guy, he's cool, right? He's got this big nose, and inside his nose, he is doing a lot of things. He's taking water out of the air that he breathes in. He has this huge surface membrane with large surface area inside his nose. He takes the water out of the air that he breathes in. He also takes the water out of the air that he breathes out. Water from the air. He filters the air from sand to make sure the air gets in, but not the sand. And he uses the water that he extracts from the air to cool the blood that flows to his brain. So let's get this straight. He's extracting water, he's recycling water, he's filtering sand, and he's cooling all inside his nose. <laughs> I 
Imagine if we could use these features in our buildings, or in industry, or in agriculture. Now, he's not the only one to take water out of the air. There's the Namib desert beetle that catches fog droplets on her wings, and she rolls the water off her back and into her mouth. Or the thorny devil from Australia who literally sucks water from the ground through his feet via capillaries, which are like straws, up his legs and across his back into his mouth. Now, these are just ideas, and not all ideas will work. But nature has almost four billion years' worth of ideas sitting there waiting for us. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. In the future, our buildings could know what season it is. They could rotate, opening and closing, responding to light and to wind and to rain to maximize the available resources. And we don't just need to restrict our ideas to buildings. We could think about cities. Our cities could be structured like ecosystems, like forests and like prairies. And in fact, some scientists are now working with city planners, um, I understand, in India and in China to ensure that city plans assimilate their local environment. The trouble is, we don't have people like Leonardo da Vinci who are skilled at combining lots of different disciplines to form coherent designs. And even if we did, we probably wouldn't have enough of them. Our, our architects are not usually botanists, and our engineers are not usually ornithologists. However, and this is a big however, using modern technology and new social media, we can form networks that bring together our different designers with our different biologists so they can share ideas and come up with designs that are more suitable and more practical, more affordable, and more sustainable. And these professional networks can collaborate not just in construction, but in many other fields, and not just here in the Middle East, but all across the world. And they can collaborate remotely with ease and with speed like never before. So they can find harmonious solutions to the global issues that we now face. Most of the information I have presented has come from a free open source project called asknature.org, developed by Janine Benyus and her team. And if you're interested, please check it out. I hope you agree that although this isn't a new subject, it's an idea worth spreading. Thanks very much. <laughs>